We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Intercept U, and we'll continue our discussion on various facets of the construction process and how it works in with uh, codes, with uh, common building practices, and then also uh, specifically with how it ties in with Intercept SIPs. I'd like to remind you, uh, please, to subscribe to our, our YouTube channel. Also, uh, like these videos. That helps us to get a little bit of uh, more recognition, a little more uh, uh, opportunity to get in front of people, and also add comments. Uh, comments help us a, a great deal uh, in knowing what to, what content to add for future videos and then how to uh, approach this, and it also helps our, our opportunity to get in front of people. So please, please uh, help us out in that way. We do, today we want to talk a little bit about something that it has become more and more common in the industry, and it's the hold downs. And you, you might notice as we talk about this, various ways to strap a building down to the foundation. We're going to talk about Simpson Strong Tie occasionally because they're kind of the Kleenex of the industry. Uh, we use them as a generic term because they make so many types of, of tie downs. We're going to talk to Joe uh, Pasma, our regional or our national sales manager, and he's got the engineering background. So I can I have a little bit of the the uh, field experience in using these, he understands why we use them and, and why we use different ones. So Joe, first of all, why are we seeing tie downs or, or, or hold downs talked about so much more than we ever did? One of the things that's happened, John, over the recent past is the, um, the American Society of Civil Engineers, ASCE, has a document that tells us structural engineers how to design buildings. And that has gone every every so many years, they update that. And in 2022, they updated it for both a big change occurred with snow loads, but um, some of the wind criteria and seismic criteria has also changed. And as we have more and more storms or events, if you will, um, hurricanes, seismic activity, earthquakes, uh, tornadoes, and and heavy snowstorms, the engineering community learns more about how things behave, how materials and how buildings, how systems behave. So in an effort to mitigate any kind of or, or destruction, damage to pro property and lives that occurs, they keep tweaking up and ratcheting up some of the design criteria. So that's happened specifically with wind. Um, and when you look at how a building stays down on its foundation, it we think about gravity loads pushing it down. That's pretty easy to figure out, but wind and earthquakes have a tendency to move the building side to side, and it wants to either slide across the foundation or rotate and, and come lift up. So the hold downs try to stop that from happening. Okay, so traditionally we've always used J-bolts in the concrete. Uh, and we have a J-bolt pattern. Usually it's four feet on center or whatever whatever it's called out. Why have we increased now to this large variety? And maybe you can explain some of the, the differences uh, and improvements from just using a J-bolt to bolt down the plate and then the panel be connected to the plate. What are we doing now? Well, the J-bolt, as you say, is, is usually a um, an anchor bolt that's installed as the concrete guys uh, are installing the form or, or putting in pouring the concrete in the forms and they just push the bolt in at that spacing that you're talking about and what those bolts do is basically keep the building from moving or sliding um, on the foundation itself they they do have some uplift capability but as buildings have bigger openings similar to the background behind me, you see some of the big, the, the steps in the concrete footings are for doors and windows. And as you take wall away and put basically empty space in there, you end up concentrating the forces on the edges of those openings. So the bigger, taller straps that you see in the background behind me are used to actually hold the building down at key locations. Those, those straps are tied into posts and in, on this particular project, we used a starwood rafter that ran across the top of the, uh, supported the roof. And that those straps actually held the posts in place so that when the building tried to lift up, it wouldn't go anywhere. So 
let's make the connections now between the various tie downs and intercept ready to assemble panels. We try to send our panels out as, as ready to assemble as possible. And I think we're, we're market leaders in, in doing that. We really work hard on making this some, uh, 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 the builder's choice is what we, what we like to refer to ourselves as to make it as simple as possible out on the site. So what do our drafters need to know? How do we, how do we make the connection between the types of tie downs that are going to be used and how we build our panels? Typically, um, we as Intercept will have third-party engineers review our shop drawings, and they'll go through and design, um, run the, the calculations for these lateral loads, whether it's wind or seismic, and determine what types of straps or anchor bolt spacings are required to res resist that sliding and overturning forces. So from a customer standpoint, when they bring a set of drawings to us, they really don't have to do anything special. We internally, through our drafting team, will coordinate with the third-party engineers that we use, and the third-party engineers will specify the anchor bolt spacing, the types of straps that need to be used. Now, again, the, the background behind me shows cast-in-place anchorages. So the concrete construction people need to know where those are going to be located when they're pouring the concrete. There's another type of, of anchor that can be installed after the concrete is poured. So if it hasn't been determined when the concrete is poured where the anchorages need to be, they can use either a, an epoxy type threaded rod or a, um, a legs, leg, um, uh, what do they call them? a lag bolt that a wedge anchor that gets drilled into the concrete and then as you tighten the nut down it expands and holds in or simpson like you were talking about has a, a product called the titan hd which is a heavy duty screw anchor that you drill a hole and use an impact wrench to put it in to the concrete to use after the concrete is poured so it's important again we go back to simpson and because when the engineer calls it out and you, you get the plans back from the engineer, it's a Simpson number. It's a Simpson part number that they always put on the plan to show us what anchor. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be their product, but it has to be something equal to that part number that's been listed. And here's here's an area that it's, it's so important for coordination between our drafter and the engineer and then also the builder and his communication with his concrete guy. Because the last thing you want is something that has to be cast in place and you find that out after the after the fact. And now all of a sudden you're going back to engineering and saying, okay, what, what else will work because we already missed this opportunity. And it's also important that our posts are in the right place uh, according to the plan so that if it is a cast in place uh, product that it, it actually hits the post because if it just hits the OSB, it's not going to qualify. So it, that, 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 that communication between everybody is so important. And it's, it's really beautiful because on our stamped drawings, when we get them stamped from a third party engineer, it's all right there. Everything is in one place. It is. And one thing to point out with that is that we as Intercept supply the panels and the posts that go in the panels, but it's up to the general contractor, the builder putting the building up to order those Simpson connectors or MyTech or whoever the connector hardware supplier is. Um, that's up to the general contractor, the builder to purchase that material from their suppliers. So when all of this is done right, what kind of wind loads can we, can we achieve? Hurricane wind loads. We can be upwards of 180 to 200 miles an hour. Um, and it's the SIPs themselves are, are very strong from that standpoint. I mean, from a, from a transverse load or a wind blowing on it, we can take pressures of, of two and 300 pounds per square foot, which is way more than what the wind is going to be. But um, it still needs to be anchored in such a way that it stays on the foundation. We've, we have, as the SIP industry, anecdotal stories of families that have been asleep in, build, in, in a home, two-story home. Tornado comes through at night and they didn't it didn't even wake them up and they came out in the morning and the foundation the house had actually shifted on the foundation but they didn't wake up during the storm so it's 
um, it's interesting to, to realize how strong and sturdy SIPs are, but they still need to be bolted down to the, to the foundation adequately. Absolutely. And so there again, when we go back to the coordination and the communication between the builder or the homeowner and our drafting team, uh, having a, an accurate zip code of where this, this, this is going to go, because if you're in the upper peninsula of Michigan, but in the middle of the, of the, of the state there, uh, the wind loads are completely different than if you're on the North shore of Lake Michigan, uh, all of a sudden the, the wind loads change dramatically. And so we have to understand all of that. Our drafter has to know that. And sometimes those are the types of things that can, could get missed in the, in the process of communication. I, I had one that was going in New Jersey and it was in the area of hurricane Sandy and oh. the engineers didn't understand that until kind of late in the process of them engineering it. Once they did, they realized they had to increase the, the hold downs for the roof panels because of lift. And so uh, being from the Midwest, uh, I've mentioned this before, but I always think about snow loads. I always uh, kind of get hung up on snow loads. I don't think a lot about lift because I live in Southern Wisconsin and uh, we don't have a lot of big wind here, but it's certainly something that has to be addressed and, and we can do that. Any other thoughts or comments that you think our, our viewers should know? You pointed out the, the zip code. I would take it one step further and say, if they know the address of the site where the building is going to be, that's really helpful for us and our third party engineers. There's um, software uh, online tools that, that are available that have the wind loads and the snow load data in them so that it makes it easy for our um, our teams to design the buildings correctly to make sure that it withstands those loads. But other than that, no, um, if, if customers and people that are working with us have questions, um, drafting team and our project managers are the are the people to go to, to to get those questions answered. And I really do think this is part of the beauty of, of the the custom nature of our of our industry and of, of Intercept in particular, uh, that we do make a very custom project specifically designed for that area, for that address, and and the ready to assemble aspect of it too. That the, all of the the necessary um, uh, openings or or whatever is necessary for those tie downs can be built right into the panels. Well, thank you so much for your time and explanations of this. And again, uh, any questions, call your regional sales manager. He can link, link you up with the, the appropriate person in our company to answer questions. And we look forward to seeing you next time on Intercept You. Thanks, John.